All right, welcome back to Getting Past the Premium, everybody. We've got an exciting one today with me. We have Cody Hauk, and Cody is a senior advisor at Premier Strategy Box. Uh, if everybody has been listening for a while, you've seen Mick Hunt on the show for a while. Uh, Mick started Premier Strategy Box and recently, I guess, brought Cody on uh, as one of their senior advisors. And so I'm excited to have you on, man. I'm looking forward to this one. No, man, same here. I, we got to connect a little bit for, I think, the first time last week and yeah. chat, chat through some of the things that you've got going on and I'm just real excited to talk with you today. Yeah, man, exactly. So why don't you give everybody a little bit of your background, uh, personally in particular, because I know you're, you know, you're in the business, right? Uh, you're fighting the fight every day, uh, which I think is important. And uh, And then a little bit about who Premier Strategy Box is as well. Yeah, man. So insurance me, I've been in the industry kind of on and off for seven years now, um, came in in a captive environment working under a really good friend of mine. Uh, I was in that for about 18 months or so as a, a personal lines advisor. Okay. Uh, did really well there. Uh, realized at that point, I wasn't going to make any money in that environment <laughs> unless my name was the one on the building. So yeah. um, jumped back out a little bit and went back into consulting and kind of rev ops in the, uh, the transportation and logistics field, which is was my background before insurance. Okay. Uh, okay. Took on the role of a fractional COO of a logistics company, did, did some really awesome things there. My contract was up and uh, decided to dive back into the insurance world. So jumped in as an agency manager for a small brokerage here in Arizona. Uh, then uh, you know, pandemic happened and that agency actually ended up going out of business. The guy decided to close the doors and oh, wow. move on to different things. So I was kind of at a crossroads and decided why not throw my name on a building and go for it. So, you know, started with the Hauk agency and dove into doing what I knew personal lines. Um, kind of saw some trends in the industry and decided I wanted to move more into the commercial side and yep. rebranded to prime risk insurance solutions. And it was all history from there. And me and Mick have, have known each other for a few years now. Um, I've been a, a student of his along with a friend and he's mentored me up along the way. And we were talking towards the end of last year and uh, kind of just decided that it made sense for me to come on board here at Premier Strategy Box and share what he's taught me as well as some of the things I've learned along the way to yeah. our consulting clients and really help really just pour into independent agents, man, and help them get where they want to go. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. I couldn't agree more. And it's a fun industry to do that with, you know, not only is it really important what we do, um, but everybody does it slightly different, which is something I love having these conversations. <clears throat> you know, we all, sell similar products, have similar clients, but at the end of the day, we can do things very differently. Mm -hmm. So dive into then a little bit about what you guys do for clients at Premier Strategy Box, um, because it's a wide breadth of consulting and other services, right? So so talk through that a little bit. Yeah, man. So we, we're we really multifaceted now, and we were really excited a few months back to launch Patty as an entry point yep. for really any agent in the country. Um, you know, the price point that Patty is gets them into working with us and really gets a taste of our consulting services and what we teach. Um, and we really wanted to be able to bring that to, you know, your, your one man shop, yep. right? Patty's a good fit for that one man shop all the way through. We've got an agency that has 35 producers wow. inside. Of yeah. Uh, so it, it really is that, that group learning environment, um, still getting a lot of the material that we do on the consulting side, but on the direct consulting side, we do a myriad of things. Now our rev ops side, we really focus on uh, helping agencies increase, increase their profitability and their EBITDA and, and really maximize efficiency in the agency. And then we have the sales ops side. That is exactly what it sounds like. We come in, we're essentially your fractional sales manager and we really work with your sales team to, to help start to, to generate that top line revenue. Yeah. Yeah, well, I think I want to hit on something there. I know that we want to focus uh, and get pretty tactical around sales process and some of those tactics that you guys teach. But I want to hit on and get your perspective briefly there. I think it's, um, uh, I don't know the words to use, but I think what I see a lot is firms that are going, especially like scratch agencies that are trying to start to hire people and maybe they get to five, 10 people or whatnot, they're growing Naturally, in any business, you reach these ceilings, right? Where you're going to have to figure out, do I hire somebody? Do I bring on a resource? Do I, you know, whatever. I'm going to have to reinvest, right? But I think 
I'd be curious your perspective, but I think a lot of times everybody's mind goes to like, well, I'm going to have to hire the sales manager, you know, and full time in person, you know, all the things versus looking for or searching out options like you guys that could come in as that fractional to um, be a consultant and to get you pass that ceiling and get you to a point where maybe you you then hire that sales manager, but it's not such a big jump. Like, does that make sense what I'm kind of trying to ask? Or I think we that's something people need to think about. I think that it makes sense for a lot of people, man. Yeah. I really do. I mean, the our, our, our pricing fluctuates a little bit based off what we're doing in the agency and the size yeah. of the agency. But I mean, bringing us in on the consulting side is still quite a bit lower in cost than what it's going to cost an agency to hire a full-time ops manager or a full-time sales manager if they're not at the point to be able to do that. Oh, yeah. And everyone in our organization has been in that seat in some organization before. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're not just, you know, move jumping around, moving from one industry to another, or, you know, we didn't, this over here didn't work out. So let's go try this. Like every one of us in the role that we're in within the organization has sat in that seat in a successful multi-million dollar organization before. So you're getting experience yeah. along with the position. And you don't have to create it or train it or, you know, do any of, of the, the leadership, let's say side of that, right. You can, it's a great way to, to continue to scale your agency, but do it in a way that is, is less maybe risky or less capital intensive resource intensive. Right. Um, so I wanted to hit on that as you, as you were talking there, I think it's very important that people need to search out and think about what other ways can I bring this value to my firm versus just hiring full-time people. Right. And there's a lot of things out there you can do. Um, well, let's dive into, uh, I really wanted to focus around sales process because this is something that you guys teach and I think you teach it very simply and, um, it, it just makes sense. So I'll just throw it at a high level and let you kind of take it where you want. But what does sales process mean? And, and, you know, how do you guys coach folks on their sales process? Yeah, man. So we really try to break the stigma of insurance being a commodity, mm -hmm. right? And the way that it's sold a lot in the industry and also the process. Speak my language. It. Preach, brother. <laughs> The process around it that agencies teach and the quote and hope and the shuck and jive <laughs> methods of let's just go out and see if we can save somebody a thousand bucks this year, right? Because mm -hmm. what does that result in? That That is, especially in the commercial side, right? Like that's just, that's a losing battle from the beginning. Yeah. But the incumbent wins that 90% of the time. Oh yeah. And what they end up doing is they ruin their reputation in the underwriting market. They ruin their client's reputation in the underwriting market. And you end up going down rabbit holes for years on accounts you're never going to win. Oh, yeah. So we start with, you know, let's just get the old cliche out of the way. There's riches in the niches, right? Yep. You need to specialize in something. And that could be that that could be an industry that could be micro niching down in an industry to a specific class that could be a line of business. Right. That could yep. be cyber. That could be you're the guy for DNO. You're the guy for work comp. Right. You're the guy for key man life policies. But really become that expert in what you're doing and identify your ideal client that you're going to go after. And you yeah. need to be disciplined in doing that. What I'll pause you there. Why do you think more people don't do that? I can tell you firsthand why they don't do it because I did it. I was scared as hell that I was going to limit the revenue that I could generate. Yep. Right. All this business is here for me to take. They're coming to me asking for me to write the business. Why not do it? Yep. Right. Yeah. I mean, it. That, that's my perspective. I The way I always put it is it's a blessing and a curse, right? In our industry, we have a product that we can sell that everybody has to buy to some degree. And, you know, again, it's a blessing because we have a lot of potential prospects in the market, but it's also a curse because the more you are a generalist, the harder it can be to scale to a degree, right? Exactly what you're saying. And so you can't get good at any one thing because you're trying to be everything to everybody. Yeah. Um, and so, again, I think it's it's a good and bad thing, but but I agree with you, you know. The other thing I'll highlight there is that I think people overlook is always think of they always think of the industry as the niche. And you mentioned like lines of coverage or, you know, a particular piece of the industry. I think don't overlook that either because 
sometimes I think that's more powerful, right? Because if you're the cyber liability go-to expert in your uh, area or whatever, um, you could work with a variety of different types of clients, but you're providing the same thing and you can build a value prop around it and you can be an expert in it, et cetera. Um, so, so keep going down that path and we, we've got, you know, our niche, uh, thought through what's next. Yeah. So we've decided who we're going to go after the size of the account, what that actually looks like, how we're going to market to them. Now we really teach prospecting, right? And everybody out there is looking for the magic pill to prospecting, the easy button. <laughs> how am I just going to sit here and these accounts are going to start rolling in? Yep. I'm going to let every one of you know right now that doesn't exist. Yeah. We preach, you pound the phone, you play the numbers game, you get your in-person drop-in strategy. That stuff is standard, man. You can't get away from it. Yeah. You have to be able to put in the work and you've got to have the discipline to do it. Yeah. But then something that is always overlooked and just switches a flip or flips a switch with people a lot is understanding like getting out of the BNIs and the chambers and those networking groups where you're just going to get bombarded with the uh, juice plus people and the Tupperware sales ladies <laughs> and going and joining us the associations of the niches yeah. that you're going to go after. Right. Yep. Get involved and go in those places with a servant heart. Right. How many people go in there and all they want is the contact list. Yep. And they're going to go drop it into an email drip. Business and card collectors. The yep. first one I attended, I showed up 45 minutes early and I just walked over and started grabbing A-frames out of the guy's truck and setting them up by the road. <laughs> and you know what? I generated over $100,000 of revenue out of that group this year. Uh, that's awesome. Uh, it, and, you know, the, the, a lot of those guys are now some of my closest friends. Yeah. Like, get get in and serve. Bring value. Yeah, love that. So you need to dial in your prospecting method, right? And I say... You need to have cold, you need to have in-person, the associations, those types of things, and you yep. need to have really good social strategy. So I personally teach those things inside of Patty and work directly with our consulting clients on those things as well. Yeah. Oh man, there's a lot of things we could go down there. So uh, first off, there is no silver bullet, 100% agree, you know, and people just need to get over that, right? It takes work and it takes a strategy. And I think that's a lot of times also where people, producers, um, you know, sometimes stumble is we haven't put some thought into a strategy, right? It's just, you know, I get a list of 100 names and I call them, right? Uh, well, that's good. You're doing activity. You know, it's maybe not the best activity for the clients you want to target, right? Um, and so I want to want to highlight that for sure. But how do you then coach folks on... So, so take like the social media side out, which I want to get to in a minute. I think that's an underutilized strategy in our industry. But um, how do you, how do I know my numbers, right? How do I get to the point where I've got, you know, if I want to target contractors, uh, be, that'd be my niche. You know, how do I know how many people I got to call? Uh, what's my strategy to just doing the work, right? Because like I can do a lot of work, but how do I know it's going to get me results? your strategy is just to start to do it. And you've got it just like anything else, right? You've got to put it to work and you've yeah. got to figure out your numbers as you go along. But I think the biggest mindset shift that needs to happen in that is you're not calling today to close deals tomorrow. Yeah. You're calling today to fill your pipeline for the next two to three years. Yeah. Your cold prospecting is a long play. Yeah. Not I'm going to call this account today and I'm going to go sign a BOR next week. Which is actually scary too when that happens. Like you think it's great. It's kind of scary. There's probably a reason. Yeah. I mean, you're going to stumble into some of that stuff oh, every yeah. once in a while, right? Like no, you one of my theory. largest accounts, I was at, I, I sponsored a contractor event and just happened to set up next to a GC that he walked over to my booth. He's like, hey, do you do work comp? He's like, "I yeah, sure the heck do. It's, you know, yeah. my one of my specialties. Okay. Um, I hate my agent. Where do I sign? <laughs> That's amazing. Mid six figure account. Yeah. I'm just, you're going to stumble into those every once in a while, just right place, right time, but you can't count on those things. And I think that that's where people get off track when it comes to cold prospecting is they do it for two or three weeks and they, I'm not seeing any results from this. Well, you put 35 decision makers in your email drip. 
just by getting some email addresses from yeah. gatekeepers. That's stuff that can pay off three or four years from now if you've got the back end content built in, right? And you're providing them value through that email drip. Yeah. Or you've now gone and connected with them on social and they're seeing value driven things you're putting out. And now when they have a problem three years from now, guess what? You're the guy that can solve that problem. Yeah. Yeah. A simple way to put it is stop selling and start sorting. Oh, right? yeah. I've sort heard that. Through, That's... Sort through those lists of the people that need your help yeah that's a great way to put it um i haven't thought through thought about it that way but yeah you are i mean because because you're pre-qualifying those prospects as well when you're cold calling you know it's always been yeah. kind of my thought around it right is like pre-qualify use it as a way to you know kind of cull your prospect list down to who are your true prospects um and you know there's lots of different strategies i'm a believer that there's no no script well, you, you should have a script that you use, but there's no, you know, silver bullet script or anything. that's going to work every time. At the end of the day, you, you get on the phone and you have conversations with people about how you can provide value. And, you know, at the end of the day, like you're saying, if you have a long-term mindset with it and you're constantly bringing those folks value and you're not wasting time and you're not asking them to do business with you on a first phone call, um, you know, it, it, it will pay off. And that's something that I even think in, People need to think about it in their sales process, you know, where it's like a badge of honor. I'll hear from people like, oh, we had to, we, we, we shoot, shoot for one call closes, you know, or one meeting closes, uh, one meeting and I get a BOR. And I just, you know, like, that's great if it works for you, you know, awesome, I guess, have at it. But we certainly have not found sustainable success in a model like that. Right. And so um, to here's me, it, I, go ahead. Yeah. Here's what I see with that methodology too is we go into those situations trying to manufacture problems, right? Bingo. And we, we start trying to cause problems that don't exist. And more, more often than not, you make yourself look like an ass and you never have an opportunity to work with that account again in the future. Yep. Arcs cold calling scripts in any conversation is, hey, I'm calling to figure out if you have these problems right now. If not, cool. Great talking to you. If you have them down the road, let me know. Yeah. I can help you solve them. If not, have a great day. Do I have permission to keep in touch with you? Yep. Ah, that's spot on because you're, that's where I, I, I hate the term salesperson in our industry because we shouldn't look at ourselves as sales people. Now, yes, are we, are we selling a solution and all that? Sure. But you should be going out and trying to solve problems, bring value to your prospects and clients and those that you're bringing enough value to will do business with you. Yep. You know, it, it scares me when we're in there trying to just sell a product because at the end of the day, these are very important products and solutions for businesses, right? And if if I'm just trying to get the sale, there's a temptation to not always do the right thing or unintentionally, you know, not do the right thing for the client, not place the yep. right policy or get the right coverage limits or whatever, because I'm just trying to make a sale. And uh, it's a slippery slope, right? And so, but if you're going into it with that, uh, mindset of I want to find problems this client has and I'm going to help solve them you're already light years ahead it might be a slower process and sometimes people don't like that but to me that's a it's advantageous actually to slow down your process you you know you want to have enough prospects in there I'd be curious your perspective on that but slowing down that sales process to really make sure you're getting the right information you're showing value through the process before you ask for the business is is to me advantageous to your process not disadvantageous yeah 100 that's 100 percent, and that's that, that's the way we we coach is we're going to go through a you know once we have we're calling for appointments right we're not having an hour-long cold call our cold call is 90 seconds at most can we get an appointment or not if we yeah. get an appointment now we're going to go have a conversation around your pain and why i'm here yep. tell me why i'm here do these things apply to you and then you have to be honest with yourself again in, can I really fix this problem? Mm -hmm. Am I doing the right thing for this client by taking them on as a client? Yeah. I don't even have the ability to solve the problem they have, <laughs> right? I've, st I've stumbled into some prospects over the last couple of years that were, I mean, one of them was a $1.2 million premium account and they were ready to sign a BOR. And then they told me they needed like 5,200 certificates a year issued. Ooh, yeah. 
And I said, I'm sorry. Like, there's no way. Yeah. I, I'm not set up for that. Yeah. And that's value right there. <laughs> you know, like, I agree with you. There's so much temptation to be able to take that on. It's big revenue. And, you know, you think you'll figure it out and all the things, but you also want to be very cognizant of your reputation in the industry, you know, and, um, but yeah, it's, it's a very difficult thing to do, but I also want to encourage everybody to, to understand where your value lies to clients and be able to say no, like you're saying, right. Have that, yeah. which takes a, a full pipeline and everything I understand, but, um, but yeah, so we've got our niche, right. We've got our, we're just going to get out and do the work, right. Talk about then how you guys coach folks after I get the opportunity. Uh, you know, you mentioned you're going in to solve problems, but just break that down a little bit further, right? Like, what am I actually doing uh, to win the business? So, again, we're going in, and if, if anyone looks at Patty, we actually have these scripts that you use in the meeting inside of the system. Yep. You literally take this thing into the new business meeting with you and read it verbatim. And it starts with, what are the things that your agent does really well that you're happy with? Talk to me about those things, mm -hmm. right? Because it's again going to, you, you run into situations along the process that people might start to get savvy with this and know that you're trying to figure out if they're price shopping or not. So you need to dig a little bit more. Yeah. Are you really using me as leverage against your cousin who holds <laughs> your accounts right now? Yeah. Because if you're just in here playing games with me and you're not going to fire your cousin at the end of the day, why am I here? Yeah. So we do have some more probing questions up in the front end of it to see if we really need to continue or if we're going to walk away. Yeah. Which you have to hold that tool through the whole process. But it's finding out what their agent is doing well, right? Finding out what really are the pain points around their agent. Again, because one, can you solve the problems? Two, is it just unrealistic? Do they want somebody picking up the phone at 11 o'clock at night whenever they call <laughs> yeah. seven days a week? Yeah. Because if you want that, that's not me. Yeah. I'll go ahead and move on now. But then it's going to go in around and start asking more uh, risk management questions surrounding the different lines of coverage for that, for whatever niche it is you're prospecting. We've got 25 different niches in there that are built out that have pain point risk management questions specifically for those niches. Yeah. So, it's it everything we do is coached or from a risk management perspective and diving into that deeper level because the markets that a lot of people play in right like everybody wants to talk about middle market stuff i play in what i like to call the medium rare market <laughs> i like to fly under the radar of the big boys yeah you know i agree because i can go in and still have somewhat of a high level conversation without having to dive into this crazy risk management practice that Let's be frank, somebody that's paying, you know, 75 grand a year in premium may not care about that stuff because it's not going to impact their premium enough for them to care about it. Yep. But we can still have an educated conversation. Yeah. Right. And have a different conversation than, you know, Johnny agency down the road is having with them. Yeah. So and I think that's key right there is different. Sorry not to interrupt you, but you want to you want to be stand out right from your from your competition. So keep going. But. Yeah. And it's just getting to the end of that. Once you've heard what their issues are, now it's getting that upfront agreement, right? Like, Hey, you have these issues. Here's how we can solve them. And then another part of this that we coach is talking about insurance as a budget and a relation to gross revenue, rather than talking premium numbers. Because if I go tell somebody your insurance is going to cost you 3% of revenue this year, that's a lot better mm -hmm. conversation to have than your premiums, 125,000. And yeah. I won't even take credit for that. That's something one of my contractors coached me on a couple of years ago <laughs> in the middle of a conversation. Yeah. He's like, Oh, everything's jumping 2% this year. Okay. I'll just up all my costs 2% this year and we'll cover it. <laughs> huh? Yeah. It's a great way to put it. So he, uh, we talk about things as a relation of a percentage of revenue because it's an easier conversation to have. And now you can talk to them about setting an insurance budget aside every year. Yeah. So then our magic line, man, I'll give it away for free is if I can solve these issues at a reasonable cost and within your budget, will you agree to do business with me? This is before we ever start filling out an application. Yep. Right. We call it an upfront agreement. 
That is magic. And we're getting that agreement to do business right there. I've heard Mick use that line before, and yeah. uh, and I didn't want to call it a line. It's it's a you know, it's an agreement with the client. You're, you're just stating your intentions, <clears throat> excuse me, up front, and making sure that you're understanding what their intentions are, right? Because if they're people will tell you, like ah, you know what I. You know, you're probably right. It, my cousin is the one that handles it. I just, I probably couldn't go to Thanksgiving dinner if if I moved this from him. And, yeah. you know, in the back of your mind, you're going, well, why the hell did you take the meeting then? You know, but a lot of people will. They can't say no up front. <laughs> like, there's a lot of reasons. Uh, <laughs> we've all been in those situations, right? Sometimes they want to fire their cousin because, you know, they don't like him at Thanksgiving or whatever. But uh, that's that's usually not the case. <laughs> um, so you want to have that conversation, um, up front and make sure that we're all on the same page. Like you understand the rules of the game, right? Yeah. Before you do any work, any true work, before you get into, um, you know, diving into, uh, any of the policies or anything like that. So, um, okay. So the client says, sure. You know, Cody, if you can solve these things, um, I'll do business with you. Uh, what happens next? Our next step, man, is, and it's something that is missed a lot, is set the expectation of what doing business with you looks like, mm -hmm. right? We're assumed, at that point, we're assuming this is a done deal. And now we're telling them how this is going to operate going forward. Yeah. One, are you the best person that I'm going to need to communicate with from here forward to gather information for us to get this transition moving? Or is there someone else I should be dealing with? Because I'm going to need copies of your policies. We're going to need to gather loss runs. We're going to have some paperwork and things we're going to need to fill out. Are you the best person I need to stay in contact with? Or is there someone else to connect with so we can get this moving? Yeah. Once that happens, we're probably looking, we'll just throw numbers, seven to 10 days to get to market, get submissions, have our conversations with our underwriters, get everything put together. Once we have that back, we'll reach out and we'll get, we'll get everything set aside and get a date lined up for the presentation. Who needs to be there for that presentation? Because that is one big thing we stress is one, identifying the decision makers yep. and making sure they're all there. Wow, we've all been right. in that situation. <laughs> not fun. That's not fun at all. And if, you know, it, it's a hard thing for people to swallow sometimes when I tell them if five people are supposed to be in the room and you show up and only four of them are there, you leave. Yeah, and reschedule. Hard. We've been there, and, yeah. And And you have to conduct yourself as a professional and value your own time, right? Yeah. Hey, we can just reschedule this when this is actually a priority for everybody. Let me know when that is. Yeah. Well, it, you know, it can seem some people don't want to be, I don't know if direct is the right word or whatever, but feel like they're coming off as an a-hole or whatnot. I think the important thing is number one, you, you want to value your time as you mentioned, but number two, you know, you don't want to, present uh too early you don't want to present to the wrong people because you can't control that message and you may never get another opportunity right yeah if there's not a fifth person there that's supposed to be there as part of the decision making uh those four people are going to try to reiterate your message to that person you're not going to get an opportunity to get in front of them right and so you want to be cautious that you don't um you know present to the wrong people are too early because you're just, you might lose that opportunity forever, right? Or for a long time. Um, when in reality, if you have those people in the room, you know, you can understand where their head's at, get through the objections and, you, you know, have a better opportunity of winning the business. And so it's not just uh, a tactic or anything like that. It's truly, you want to put yourself in the best position, but you also want to put the client in the best position because you want them to understand your value. A hundred percent. And I, I think that we missed the mark on that as, as professionals in our industry as well, right? Like yeah. we hold professional licenses for what we do yet. We don't hold ourselves in that esteem. Yeah. Right? We, make, we make ourselves available to our clients at their beck and call. Right. Yeah. We, we let prospects control the control, the situation and control the process, pick up the phone and call your doctor right now and say, Hey, I'm coming <laughs> in to see you at 10 o'clock on Friday morning. You better be there and see what they say back to you. <laughs> yeah yeah i i've got something in august available <laughs> exactly <laughs> yeah. yet we don't hold ourselves in that same esteem we don't yeah. value our own time and what does that do that puts us in a place of seeming like we're desperate and we're willing to bend for anyone just to get business yeah 
Yeah, no, I agree with that. I mean, a thousand fold, I think. And I wonder sometimes why that is in our industry, you know, and I think it's, again, it goes back to that looking at ourselves as salespeople, not advisors, you know, and and our value should be in the advice we give to our clients. Um, in, in viewing ourselves as one of the trusted advisors for those clients is, is such an important piece because we are, you know, and I, I sometimes struggle with that as to why our industry puts ourselves in that position. You know, I'd be curious if you have any thoughts around that, but I think it is, I agree with you. It's a mind shift. Once you do make that mind shift, you will, you'll realize you all of a sudden speak differently, you know? you challenge a, a prospect when, you know, before, if you're trying to just win the business and sell a policy, you know, you're going to, again, you're going to do anything you can for them, but now you might challenge them on their thoughts and uh, how they should be looking at this process or whatever. Um, it puts you in a much more confident position when you can view yourself that way as providing value, not just selling a product. And I think that's it, man. Mindset has so much to do with it. Yeah, it really does. Like we, we need to look at ourselves as being the experts and in industry professionals that we are yeah and when we don't see ourselves that way your prospects can sense it <laughs> yeah. right they, they've seen, they've seen salespeople in and out of their office throughout their uh, throughout this 90 day prospecting period when their pro- policies are coming up for renewal right mm-hmm. they've seen dang one of them yep and they're begging for the business oh, yeah. so walk in there and you're confident and what not not being pompous about it but carrying yourselves in a way of it's a privilege to do business with me. Yeah. Right. I know what I'm doing and I'm selective as to who I do business with. Yep. So I need to make sure you're a good fit to do business with me too. Yeah. We will tell clients that, I mean, we'll, you know, not in, not in an arrogant or confrontational way, but, Sometimes I think they appreciate it. in the first couple of meetings, you know, we're saying, hey, we're just as much vetting, you know, our prospects as you are vetting us. And we think that's very important because, uh, you know, we want to do business with folks that want a model that we can provide. Uh, that only provides value to not only you, but also our other clients, because then we can spend the right amount of time with it. We can build the right resources. We can allocate, uh, you know, dollars in the right areas and, um so we're we're as much vetting that prospect as they are us. And I think that's important. And I think um, that scares agents too, right? Yeah. Because they think that it, one rebuttal I get with that a lot is, well, what if they turn around and leave me a bad review or say something bad about me and say that I wouldn't, I refuse to help them. Yeah. Just tell them that you're not the best fit for them and, yeah. you know, have a referral relationship with another brokerage or something that will take that stuff. Yep. Right. There are agents out there that will, you know, they're not niching down and becoming specialists and they are more generalist or are okay taking some of those smaller accounts or heavy service load stuff or whatever it is. You can still help them and you can do that in a way that is tactful. Yeah. If you do tell somebody that you're not a fit. Well, like what's the other alternative, right? If you do that right and you and you do right by the client, but you you refer them somewhere else, but and they leave you a bad review because of that, like what was your alternative to do business with them? And you want them as your client at that point? Like, no way (laughs) that, you know, that's just not the type of person you want to do business with period. Um, And, and so you gotta be, you have to be protective of you, your time, your, your uh, agency, your team, all those things. Of course. And evaluating those types of things is so important, man. I mean, we, we talk about these things in some social groups and, we get a lot of pushback. Like, what do you, what do you mean? You're here to help people. That's why you got in the business. People need help. You should help anybody you can. Well, I'm sorry, but last I checked, we're in a for-profit industry. Yeah. We're not a charity. I don't need to lose money writing a policy. Yeah. Well, that, and I, I argue the flip side of that. And they say, well, what if I'm not the best person to handle that type of a client? Then I'm actually doing them a disservice. Like, could I could I quote unquote help them and provide a policy to them? Sure. I can write a policy for almost anybody, yeah. but does that mean that I'm the best fit for them? and can provide them value in their business. Like, no, not always. Yeah. <clears throat> and so, you know, if you're coming at it from that perspective, you got to think of the flip side too. Um, but I, I wanted to spend some time Cody on, uh, on Patty a little bit. And then, you know, 
I think it's such a valuable resource, especially for the investment that you guys have put on it. Um, and so I want you to spend a little bit of time just describing what it is, because we've talked about it a little bit here, but uh, go into a little bit more detail about what Patty is and what an agent could, could learn and use it for. Yeah, man. So Patty is short for the Premier Agency Development Institute. And it really is a lot of what we talked about today on this from a producer standpoint. Patty's broken down into different lounges. We have exclusive agency principal content. We have a sa exclusive sales producer content. We have, if you have operation staff in your agency, we have exclusive operations content. And then we have account manager content. And in each one of those lounges, there's live weekly or bi-weekly training on the things that we teach from agency best practices and industry best practices from the consulting side. It's just in more of a group learning environment than it is having that one-on-one -on -one attention from us. Yep. So we're teaching these things live every week, which is completely different from many other things that you see. Yeah. I, again, different standpoint is every one of us that are here teaching the courses, either one or still actively running an agency and fighting the fight with agents every day. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, you have guys like Mick that have just done things up and above, you know, have been where everybody wants to go. Yeah. yeah. You know? Um, so I think that, that also sets us apart a little bit. And then not only are we doing the live training, we do have some self-paced courses around like, you know, soft skills and how to, how to co sell consultatively. Yeah. Um, some different things there. We're developing our commercial foundations course that will be kind of designation light. Yeah. If people are coming into the industry and need a commercial mm -hmm. education, they'll have mm -hmm. it there that they can go in and do those types of things. But then you, I, we've made mention of some of the playbooks, right? That you yep. can take into a new business meeting with you. If you want to get into a niche, we've built a playbook literally from start to finish from here's how you start to prospect to here's what you do in the new business appointment to here's how you do an in-depth risk analysis of that business to here's all your class codes for any, any particular code you could need to write there. And it's all in one little nice nine page document. That's awesome. For every niche. And yeah. that's the, that's how to sell it. Not only did we do that, we've built the supporting stewardship reports to help you retain the business yeah. for all your account managers. And those are living documents in there that any member of Patty can go in and take. So that's from a sales and renewal standpoint. We've got just tons and tons of resources in there from best practices of running your agency to hiring, to job descriptions, to employee reviews, to pay scales, to you know, really anything you could need to run your agency is available in there. That's awesome. Yeah, and I knew that uh, or I wanted you to hit on, you know, that briefly, just because I think if people aren't at least learning about Patty right now, uh, and you're having some of these, uh, struggles or looking to build some of these things out, you know, it's crazy the value you can get, uh, yeah. from that subscription. So I would encourage everybody to, to check that out. So what, uh, what do we miss in this conversation, Cody, that you think is relevant to hit on before we kind of get to how people can get a hold of you, et cetera? You know, man, I think we've hit everything from the, from, from the <laughs> premier strategy box side, man. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm passionate about sales, man. It, it's, it, it's where I live. I, I love the sales side of our industry. I think it's a lot of fun yep. and I might be one of the weird ones that, that hmm. feels that way, but I love it. And being able to marry that with, you know, my rev ops and consulting background before I came into insurance. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just, it, I love everything about our industry, man. It's a lot of fun. And we just, yeah. I hope that it came across that way, man, that my heart just really lies with helping people achieve everything they want to achieve in this industry. Yeah. And I think that's all of us at PSB. <laughs> oh, totally. Uh, totally. Some great people there. And I think you can tell her you have some passion around it, man. So that's, <laughs> that's exciting. So awesome. Well, thank How can uh, folks that want to learn more about PSB or, or Premier Strategy Box, I should say, uh, or Patty, uh, how can they get a hold of you to learn more? Yeah. So if you want to check out Patty, Patty's website is agencydevelopment.com. 
don't know how Mick was able to snag <laughs> that domain, but uh, agencydevelopment.com for Patty, my strategy box for Premier Strategy Box. If you're interested in our consulting services, um, you can connect with me across every dang social platform that's that exists. Yep. Just under my name. So awesome, man. Well, thank you for the time today. This was this was great. I know everybody took a lot out of it. And so uh, appreciate your time. Yeah, man. It's a blast. Thanks for having me, Elliot. All right. Thanks, man. Everybody, we will see you next week. See ya.